Well, thanks very much. I think we will uh, begin. There may be people joining as we as we go along. The title of this webinar um, conducted uh, by the Institute of Health Economics is Combination uh, Regimens, Reimbursement Challenges and Solutions. And we uh, had done some work uh, late last year and early this uh, year, which we wanted to share more broadly. And we'll providing links and notices of how to get the uh, fulsome uh, report at the end of the presentation. We can just have the next slide, Don. We do want it to uh, do, as we traditionally do, a land acknowledgement from the Institute of uh, Health Economics. Uh, we recognize that meeting participants are located in many different parts of the country, and we respect the treaties that were made on those territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. The IHE is mindful of the ongoing and enduring effects of systemic racism and are dedicated to creating safe and inclusive spaces to strengthen collaboration and engender change. And we accept our personal responsibility of incorporating indigenous perspectives where appropriate and respecting, uh, uh, building respectful relationships with indigenous communities through all the work that we do. Uh, and uh, just want to know that the IG were located actually in the municipal ward six in Edmonton, which was just in the last few years renamed and all the wards have indigenous names in the city of Edmonton. And we're in the indigenous uh, ward of O'Damon, which is the strawberry, which we like it represents the heart of Edmonton, but it's also a symbol for traditional uh, uh, medicine. Next slide. About the IG, we have a head office uh, in Edmonton. We have 35 plus staff, various contractors, and we have core programs in health technology assessment and evidence synthesis, health economics, health policy engagement, and a health industry innovation platform. Our vision and mission are outlined here. We are a uh, nonprofit uh, research organization. Next slide. So the two people presenting today uh, myself, um, John Sproul, I'm the Senior Policy Director at the Institute of Health Economics, uh, and uh, my associate, Don Husero, who is a Senior Research Associate and does a lot of, uh, we do a lot of work together in terms of engaging uh, with industry and public payers around a variety of policy issues. And uh, we collaborated uh, with uh, a colleague, Chris Henschel from the United Kingdom on this particular uh, uh, project moving forward. Uh, so next slide. So about the IG, as I said, this is just a quick um, overview. We're an independent nonprofit with key competencies, and we have a history of providing advice and independent research, public facing and confidential to ministers of health, private industry, senior public servants, and to national agencies. And this is just a listing of some of the activities we do uh, we've established this network of Alberta Health Economists. We're a member and we act as the host for the International Network of Agencies for Health Technology Assessment, ANATA, uh, which is the club that does uh, HTA uh, around the world. And um, some of the members are CADF, um, PBS in Australia, ICWIC in Germany. So, so we work in that space of health technology assessment. Uh, and then there is uh, a list of other activities we recently did become one of the inaugural core network partners uh, for the Canadian Post-Market Drug Evaluation Network, which we're really happy to, and that's part of an Alberta, uh, we're part of the Alberta uh, Coalition. Next slide. About the sponsors of the round table that we conducted, um, we, uh, we, this webinar, webinar that we're conducting right now was organized by ourselves uh, and it was related to a project in late 2022, early 2023, which was supported by uh, these following companies, Amgen Canada, uh, GSK, Pfizer, Abzi, and uh, Janssen. Um, and they provided support uh, uh, in 2022 um, for, for the project which we completed. The views in our, our work and our project uh, expressed do not necessarily represent the official position of any of the individual participants and organizations who participated in this work, and that's outlined. We will present an overview of the approach and the results of the Pan-Canadian virtual co uh, conversation uh, and recommendations which arose from that. And uh, I think I might pass over to my colleague Don now to 
review through um, the key uh, points raised and recommendations that came out of the report and the process that was done. And at the end, happy we'll be happy to respond to uh, any questions. And we anticipate the webinar will be um, in total around 45 minutes to, to possibly an hour if there's a bunch of questions, but uh, we will try and keep um, ourselves pithy in terms of the presentation. But uh, before I pass it on, I really want to thank actually all the public sector and private sector participants who really helped contribute to uh, this uh, work. But uh, over to Don. All right. Um, wonderful. So um, and just before I move on, we're going to talk about combination therapies in this uh, webinar, but uh, there is a Q&A function. So uh, you can actually ask questions. Uh, you can ask them as we go. Uh, we'll monitor the Q&A, uh, but of course we'll have a dedicated time for Q&A at the end. Uh, it also allows you to ask it in anonymous form if that's something uh, you feel you need to do. Uh, so uh, we're happy to receive them that way as well. Um, so uh, we're talking about combination therapies um, and in this webinar, and we just have to define terms before we talk about issues. Uh, combination therapy, as you may have guessed, is the use of two or more therapies uh, together. Um, and uh, the intention, you, as with any therapy, uh, typically is to improve uh, patient outcomes, uh, but it could also improve patient experiences, caregiver experiences, uh, or other broader benefits uh, to society uh, when we use these things. Um, it could be two or more separate products taken together, or it could be products taken in close sequence, uh, which we call combination regimens. Uh, it also, it could be what we call fixed dose combinations, which are things that are uh, put together in one, uh, in one package. So uh, there are a number of things we're talking about. I think for the purpose of uh, this uh, webinar and part of the issues that have been raised, have come out of the use of combination regimens in cancer, which is something that have been used for a very long time. There's typically in cancer, we see uh, multiple regimens used at once. Uh, however, um, there are uh, challenges uh, that can occur uh, in certain circumstances with combination uh, products, and we're going to get into that. Um, before we get into some of the more specific payer and manufacturer challenges, uh, it's important to point out that uh, the challenges uh, that we see with combination products are not simply uh, between uh, payers and uh, manufacturers, that uh, there are a number of stakeholders that uh, may have uh, similar or uh, parallel challenges, uh, such as regulators, uh, which actually have to think about uh, the benefit risk ratio and the questions that regulators ask of any therapeutic intervention, uh, HTA bodies uh, that uh, have to assess the value of a combination product uh, and have to decide uh, potentially how to attribute value to individual components of the combination product uh, and the payers uh, who have to reimburse these regimens uh, and also think about the implementation issues with healthcare administrators uh, to develop uh, new care protocols uh, and some of the logistics. Uh, we may have combination products involve oral agents and uh, injectable agents. And in some provinces that could involve different budgets, different people. Um, so, and those things all have to be uh, orchestrated. And of course the product innovators and manufacturers have to consider about uh, how to promote combination products uh, they may have a label that suggests that their product can be used in combination with another product. Um, however, um, you know, the other product may not necessarily have that in their label. So uh, we have situations uh, where there is a legal framework around uh, the use uh, and uh, promotion of these products. So I think the reason this uh, in particular has come to the fore is that, as I said, combination products have been used for a long time in cancer. But when we see two brand new products, um, and typically brand new products, what I mean is branded products 
that have uh, higher prices. So they're not generic products. Um, what we are seeing now is uh, a drug may come into Cadeth, for example, uh, and it may lead to a recommendation uh, that um, the, the value of the product is not commensurate with the benefits in terms of the quality adjusted life years. So Cadeth may say, uh, this current price, uh, we, we would recommend that the drug be used, but conditional on a price reduction. So they could recommend, for example, a 50% price reduction, uh, or they could recommend more, but uh, after a negotiation, uh, let's pretend a 50% uh, price reduction net effective, uh, typically um, done with rebates. So the price has changed necessarily, but there are rebates that uh, lend to that. Uh, so we have a drug that now um, has, uh, from a payer standpoint, a 50% uh, price reduction. What happens is now uh, along comes drug number two. Now drug, drug number two uh, may have, may provide similar benefits in terms of the number of qualities that it provides. So from a CADET standpoint, um, it's uh, amenable to uh, a price reduction recommendation. Uh, but in the from a CADA standpoint, they're using list prices because net effective uh, prices uh, from confidential rebates are confidential. So we don't really know uh, what these are. So uh, what we're trying to show with this graph is you have now drug A and drug B. Drug A may only provide 25% more qualities. Uh, and yet um, it's uh, they're asking for uh, similar price to drug A. Um, so now we have a situation where Cadet will say, well, uh, this is not cost effective at any price. Um, even if you give it away for free, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be uh, cost effective. You need a greater than 100% price reduction um, uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, benefits. And the drug B price reduction, uh, this is a, in a case where um, Drug B um, is uh, reduced uh, more than 100%. Um, but what we really want to achieve uh, ultimately is uh, if the drugs actually provide similar benefits, uh, we may want to have reductions in both prices. Uh, but this is not something that's uh, tenable under the current, um, current framework. Um, usually what we're doing is the net effective price for drug A has already been established. And now we're trying to deal with uh, the net effective price uh, for drug B. So the net, so ultimately, what's happening is the new drug, the drug B, the second, the, the drug that is coming on top in the combination drug regimen, uh, is bearing the brunt uh, of the discounts from the value of the combination therapy. So what to do? Um, uh, well, there's a few things going on here. As I said, this is all based on list prices. Um, and uh, so the Cadeth price reduction recommendations are based on list prices and they focus on the add-on therapy. They're not focusing on the combination therapy per se. Um, they are not uh, also uh, trying to attribute value to each of the component therapies. They're simply attributing the value uh, to the new therapy. Um, so when you're applying uh, $50,000 per additional quality thresholds uh, to a combination regimen um, and you're focused on the new therapy and you're focused on list prices, uh, you end up with these situations of um, even giving it away for free may not be cost effective. Um, if you said to Kadeth, well, you should potentially attribute value uh, to each component, well, there's no well-defined methodology to do that. Um, and um, so this is, a, and this is a situation also where the drugs used in this combination may be used in other uh, situations as well. So uh, we might want to consider the individual value that a drug provides uh, across indications. Um, so when we're uh, having a fair price negotiation, uh, we may want to consider these indication-specific pricing, uh, but that might be challenging in some jurisdictions. Um, it may also be challenging to renegotiate prices with 
uh, the uh, with the manufacturer of drug A uh, when a drug B comes along. Uh, it may also be challenging to have multilateral negotiation. For example, the PCPA is not necessarily set up to have uh, negotiations with manufacturers simultaneously. And you could, you could say to yourself, well, maybe the manufacturers should actually get together and think about uh, how they might join forces. They're not, there's no conflict of interest per se. Uh, they both um, have therapies that can benefit patients, but that may also be problematic. So, so these all, all these challenges uh, lead us to believe there's uh, possibly a, a framework for assessment or reimbursement that has to consider uh, the existing components uh, in terms of the prices uh, of the existing components in the combination, uh, the price of the new components, uh, and potentially uses specific or indication specific pricing. Uh, John, we... just one quick, because uh, a question rose just on this uh, slide, and I, I'm not sure you're going to be in a position to answer, but might have an opinion. Uh, in your opinion, how do you think CADIS will recommend price reduction recommendations when it is a novel, novel combination therapy, not a novel existing kind of thing? In, and particularly oncology specific. So I don't know if you had any comments when you had two novel uh, things uh, coming together as a combination. Well, uh, we'll get into that further. I think if it's yeah. the same manufacturer, then it doesn't really matter that there's two components, does it? I mean, yeah. the same manufacturer is just, it's the same idea as having a single drug. Um, they'll treat it that way. Um, however, if it just happens to be two, I mean, we haven't had this situation, but there could in theory be two novel components of each of which have never been seen by Cadith. And it could be from two different manufacturers. Um, that's a, an interesting, it's an interesting thing. Like for example, let's say one of the novel ones is uh, being funded through a private insurance or something. And maybe outside, of, maybe this isn't to do with cancer. We haven't run across that situation yet, um, but I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to, how, how that might, uh, I'd have to give it some further thought. How about, how about we go for that? Um, so um, some, I, I've hinted at this already. So well, how do we deal with this? Well, one of the ways that uh, things that are being done elsewhere to deal with this, because uh, Canada is not the only jurisdiction uh, necessarily that's dealing with this. One is you could um, look at the assessment of reduction in price of each component. So the HDA body could be doing that. Uh, and then uh, there could be also built into PLA arrangements uh, from the payer side that if these combination products enter that there might be price adjustments uh, due to the entry of combination products. Uh, that might be something uh, that could be done to make sure um, payers uh, uh, are either not paying too much or, or manufacturers of the new products uh, that are being combined uh, are not being asked to reduce their prices too much. Uh, there could also be, uh, just like in other sectors, uh, a co-promotion uh, uh, co or uh, manufacturers making uh, agreements between themselves. Uh, or, uh, as I said, a multilateral agreement, a new uh, but that re require a new arbitration framework uh, for the PCPA. So these are a couple of ideas. Uh, we thought this was a starting point, and then we uh, and then the idea was let's have a discussion to see how to proceed ahead. John, if I might say one thing, we did um, early on because there was some we did have some links into discussions that occurred the previous uh, year in, there was a large event in Australia with some international payers talking about this combination uh, therapy issue. And there was also some initiatives which took place in Europe around this discussion. And we were, um, it was helpful that uh, an individual who'd been involved in facilitating and participating in some of those discussions, Dr. Henschel, uh, was able to moderate our particular discussion. So we were able to bring in a bit of those reflections. And I think Don in the early work for the backgrounder highlighted into those two large groupings of, of approaches that were being done, uh, uh, which we used to frame the discussion in, in Canada. So I just wanted to highlight that we were building off some other international discussions. 
and more specific details about how we did this. Um, and that's right. We, we did actually uh, look at the literature and look what other people had done first. Um, and so it was uh, convenient that uh, there have been actually other discussions. So there've been people who've been not just writing about this, but more focused and having workshops around this. Um, we then uh, used this information, as uh, John just said, to frame a discussion. We invited uh, individuals that could share perspectives from HTA industry and payers to a multi-stakeholder uh, perspectives uh, type of approach, deliberative uh, approach. Uh, and we asked these types of questions, or we asked these questions specifically. Um, is there agreement as to the extent and urgency of the problem? What are the key issues that need to be resolved? Are there some general solutions that are appropriate and feasible? Has anything been missed? And, and uh, what are uh, key issues that need to be resolved. I'm repeating a question. We <laughs> let's skip the last question. I think it's uh, I've duplicated it somehow. So we had breakout groups uh, among uh, these multiple stakeholders. We uh, uh, then asked more specific questions uh, about feasible solutions. And then we asked the questions, well, what conditions do we are essential before we proceed ahead? What conditions are nice to have um, and who and who needs to proceed ahead and in, in, in Canada and, and what needs to be done. Uh, so again, getting to some practical kind of recommendations about how to move this issue forward. Um, and this is just a schematic uh, again of how we did things uh, with a literature review, uh, you know, with an evidence-based approach uh, or an evidence-based policy approach providing uh, and framing the discussion with proposed options, having the virtual discussion with stakeholders, having them review uh, the notes, uh, and then uh, coming out with a final IHE report. And I'll give you a link uh, to that, but I think that link was also provided in your email to the report. And uh, this report describes proposed options and recommendations, and I'm going to go over these uh, now. So just in case you're wondering which invited perspectives you have, as uh, John mentioned, Dr. Chris Henschel was our moderator and has actually been involved in this area before. Uh, we were fortunate to have these payers uh, uh, who we've invited uh, to attend, uh, including Daryl Ben, Scott Kavira, Chad Mitchell, Mitch Maneo, and uh, Lynn Nakashima. Uh, on the HTA side, uh, we tried to get a lot of perspectives from both current and uh, uh, ex-HTA uh, folks. And uh, here are the names uh, listed here. Um, and then, or ex-HTA payers, I should mention, because some folks uh, uh, had a role as payer uh, in the past. Uh, and then um, we also invited perspectives uh, from uh, manufacturers. And, this is a select group of manufacturers, uh, basically uh, sponsors uh, of, of uh, this deliberative approach and report. Um, and so, uh, but also very fortunate because some of these folks are dealing with this issue or have dealt with this issue uh, personally. And so uh, they had some things to say. So, as I said, uh, we asked these questions, is there agreement as the extent and urgency of the problem? And that was an interesting discussion uh, because there was general acknowledgement that it's an issue, uh, but I think we sort of got a sense from the room that there was, it was a, maybe less of an issue for payers uh, as it is uh, for some manufacturers. I think there was also an acknowledgement that some manufacturers probably don't ever have to deal with this problem or at least up till now have not had to deal with this problem. Um, and, um, and as I indicated before, the problem is really with new sole source branded therapies, because, uh, for example, in the world of oncology, um, you know, multiple treatment regimens, uh, combination therapies, that's a par for the course. Uh, we use them all the time. Um, but we're, we're in this new era where we may have branded therapies and they might be, they might be, uh, biologics or something that, uh, also gives them a, a high price point, which might lead to recommendations of price reduction. Uh, and as I've indicated before, the other issue is that uh, we do use list prices to create recommendations for uh, price reductions. Uh, and although that might uh, 
reflect in some level the kind of price reductions that are desirable. Uh, once you're doing this in the realm of combination therapies, you can get very unrealistic uh, recommendations. It sort of exaggerates uh, uh, the issue that we already have with using list prices. So what do we need? Uh, we asked the question, what are some general solutions? Um, participants basically uh, believe that we need a framework that helps payers to understand the value of the combination, uh, coupled with an approach to adjusting prices of individual components. Um, most folks felt like we didn't actually have to build anything new, that we had the right tools, but we may have to create some new processes or modify approaches potentially for combination therapies. Um, the idea that while well, maybe for combination therapies, we adjust the threshold, something that is also brought up in other areas like rare disease and the like, um, was felt not to be a practical solution. And I can just say that typically, I think anytime you propose to adjust the threshold, you're going to find that's uh, the general consensus uh, among uh, many. So what about the themes that came out of the discussion? Well, we said, what are the conditions then? If we're going to have a feasible solution, we're going to have one of these frameworks, what do we need to have? Um, and so uh, first of all, we, we focused on what we said we have to have. Um, and one of the things that came out of this uh, right off the bat was we do need to, if we're going to change this, um, if payers are going to change things, if HDA bodies are going to change things, if manufacturers are going to change their approach, we do have to have a, uh, an even more compelling argument for this change. Um, so, you know, um, part of the concern, for example, is if you have um, price reduction uh, recommendations that are out of line with reality because of the issues that I pointed out earlier, because you're using non-list prices and you're not considering the value of each individual therapy. Um, the, one of the concerns is that uh, these recommendations themselves uh, might lead to uh, prolonged negotiation. Um, but I think some participants felt like that's an open question. What we really need to do is gather some further understanding uh, from previous cases and the broader, broader commercial community to see um, if that's in fact what's going on. Uh, if these sort of out of these unrealistic price recommendations are actually creating some sort of downstream problem, either uh, too much weight uh, in a price negotiated process or other issues uh, that might stem from that. Uh, so I guess the question, the, uh, the, there was a feeling that that's still an open question and what we should be doing is gathering more information. Um, they're uh, at its core cross stakeholder engagement discussion coupled with uh, joint problem solving is required. So there was great acknowledgement of this. Um, we need heightened engagement across individual stakeholders earlier in the process. Um, and, you know, there was general acknowledgement that there are fewer opportunities. There's not many opportunities for that kind of engagement and deliberation and dialogue uh, and exchange. Uh, but uh, we should be working towards that. And, you know, I can tell you, John and I have done many of these multi-stakeholder uh, discussions in the past, and uh, they're not always easy. I mean, they're not, uh, it's, it's not always easy to find, uh, you know, the means to, to exchange information in a, in a really a useful way. And that's just the nature of, uh, of, of, government and payers and HTA and manufacturers. And, and so, uh, but I mean, if we're ever going to make any kind of progress, I think and Don, Don, yeah. it's required. Yeah, Don, yeah. I just wanted to note on your first point. Uh, one is I think participation was really great and, and quite frank discussion amongst the players. Uh, the compelling argument for change is interesting. That discussion uh, was, the burning platform kind of discussion and and payers were generally saying okay it might be but but it wasn't a present problem to them at the the current time so i think there was a real desire is canada significantly performing poorly in terms of access and approaches to combination pricing um 
compared to other jurisdictions, because that can always be a compelling argument. Or is it something that I really have to pay attention to right now? And so I think there was some good uh, information that started to emerge about maybe it's not a day-to-day -day concern right now, but look forward to the future in which the number of combination therapies that are going to be coming through the pipeline that are going to be hitting, hitting payers. And, and that just, I think, needed to be documented and quantified in order to to spark policy action. Uh, so I think the payers were willing to do it, but they said, God, I've got so many things on my plate right now. This is not my uh, my major priority, but hey, uh, open to uh, having that case presented, which I think was uh, 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 some, some useful international comparative work, I think, and also some pipeline identification of volumes was gonna be something that was gonna be a useful follow-up action. Well, and I think the flip side is that um, there, there was a feeling that some manufacturers themselves may not be feeling this is a burning platform, and it's because they're not there yet. They haven't actually suffered through this. So, um, you know, there has to be also awareness and a look at pipelines and um, to make it more of a compelling argument for multiple, you know, for the community of manufacturers to, to drive this forward. Um. So um, there was certainly uh, within this, nobody felt like uh, we should get around this idea of having price listing agreements with uh, our product listing agreements with individual manufacturers. We still want to get there. Uh, we just want to do it in such a way that um, uh, we don't have any challenges when it comes to combination therapies being introduced. And as John mentioned, there are more and more of these things coming. So this problem is not something that's going to go away. Um, we also discussed uh, in the context of this meeting what uh, conditions uh, are nice to have uh, to create feasible solutions uh, to product listing arrangements with combination therapies. Um, and um, some folks uh, did mention that indication specific utilization certainly would be nice to have. Sorry. Um, uh, because uh, if we, the more we know about indication specific uh, utilization is certainly helpful for formulary management, but it's also helpful for manufacturers who are managing their portfolios. Um, you know, right now we kind of have a blended price approach. Sometimes we don't have a handle on indication specific utilization. So everybody's sort of uncertain and taking, and there's guesses that are having to be made. Uh, and that might not be the best way uh, to manage formularies and manage portfolios. Um, and then uh, it was pointed out also that oral oncology drugs may pose a problem for some jurisdictions that have different programs um, to fund these products. Um, value attribution uh, would also be helpful. Uh, so uh, people didn't say it was essential, but if you can actually attribute the value to individual components, and as I said before, there is no established methodology uh, that could also be a, a good starting point to thinking about uh, how should uh, how should net effective prices change uh, when combos are introduced. So ultimately, we formulated uh, four recommendations. Um, the recommendations, and these follow from the things that would be nice to have and essential to have. Um, so number one was uh, to explore industry and payer buy-in. Uh, and so uh, as already mentioned, uh, we should be exploring the backbone therapy manufacturers willingness to engage or perceive barriers uh, because a lot of this has to do with uh, the backbone manufacturer. If they're not sort of willing to, and currently the process is in some cases, PCPA does go to the backbone manufacturer, not always. Uh, and then, uh, uh, what we heard was um, there are mixed, uh, there's a mixed reception to this. There's not always a willingness to engage, uh, but sometimes there has been. Uh, obviously, a uh, backbone manufacturer can benefit by having increased utilization of their product, uh, but on the other hand, they may have strategic or other reasons uh, not to want their product to be utilized uh, in a combination therapy, particularly since it's not, as I mentioned before, their license indication, it's somebody else's indication. Um, the other thing is to survey the wider payer community. We had a good representation of payers at our meeting and ex-payers. 
Uh, however, uh, it does require full buy-in, so the intent of a process and potential barriers to the approach would need to be further clarified uh, through this. John, just to know, Ben um, uh, Peacock had just, and Ben had participated in the roundtable, just highlighted a, a question in the comments indicating that uh, at the roundtable, it certainly felt that stakeholders involved did have some skin in the game, but there were some uh, who felt that it wasn't an urgent pressing in, uh, issue to their attention. He wondered about a recommendation with trying to bring them uh, to the table for a more effectively jointly created solution. And I think um, just in response to that, we felt the gathering of the the uh, evidence of wh what performance of, of Canada's performance in addressing these things early uh, uh, would help provide a, com in comparison to other jurisdictions because Canada always responds with if we're behind or ahead of other particular jurisdictions, it's important. And one thing just you know we were thinking of because there have been efforts in other countries to address this um, that were being initiated in the last couple of years and anticipating um, uh, perhaps in early 2024, IG, we were thinking about perhaps I seeing exploring how those are going because I know that Nice in the UK was moving forward on certain approaches to deal with this. Europe uh, was much more, uh, I think, uh, top down authoritative in price setting, which meant uh, it provided kind of a, uh, a consistent um, level playing field. And so, uh, since um, there were some early discussions in the last couple of years in Australia, Europe, and and the UK it would be a time to do a bit of a snapshot of how are those approaches going? Some, I understand, uh, are moving slower than they anticipated, some of those things. So I think there's some lessons to 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 uh, learn. But uh, we are thinking of actually bringing some of the players from those uh, involved in a way to have a bit of a discussion, but uh, to drive things uh, forward. And um, so that is uh, just one comment there. Uh, recommendation two uh, was uh, related to um, gathering baseline information and uh, establishing a background case to further characterize and address this issue. Um, burning platforms are uh, easier to set if we really understand that the platform is burning. We need to really understand uh, fully um, the implications of not having uh, a fulsome process around this. So. Um, some of the recommendations uh, related to this involve communicating to all implicated manufacturers. Uh, uh, so, for example, we could have we could have uh, we we did hear that some manufacturers just had no idea that competitors were um, involving their products in combination therapies, and if we did communicate earlier on. Uh, that their products were being assessed in the in the context of combination therapy. Uh, that's a that's a, something that uh, would be helpful. Um, we should be tracking and reporting the number of new and expected branded combinations. If we we know that there's going to be an increased number of these, but the question is is how much how many and and, and over what time period um, and um, how many are not coming to Canada and how many are in other jurisdictions and so we need numbers. Uh, we need uh, to uh, understand the magnitude of this issue. Uh, we may need an independent assessment or a benchmark study on Canadians' comparative access so to these combination therapies. It's possible that manufacturers, knowing that Canada is going to give them a uh, not cost-effective, even if it's for free, recommendation, uh, and wanting to avoid that strategically, and uh, they may have reasons to do so, uh, they may decide not to bring in a product into Canada that may still be providing health uh, and other benefits to uh, patients and uh, Canadian populations. So we should be trying to understand if that's the case um, and because that's uh, something uh, that we don't think is desirable and we want to uh, we want to deal with. Uh, we should be looking at current timelines because if, if this is in fact impacting timelines, we'd want to know that, that that's exactly the case. And we want to know by how much is it impacting timelines uh, and over what time, et cetera. Um, 
And so, you know, there was also a feeling that we should be using this report and these recommendations to leverage conversation uh, and identify any barriers to advancing these discussions uh, and what would be required to actually make this a burning issue, both among payers and uh, manufacturers. Recommendation three was creating a safe space. And so this is what we, I just uh, mentioned in terms of we need platforms to have uh, multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, and we need, in this case, a safe space to develop a mutually recognized process. So we're gonna create a prioritization framework. Um, stakeholders are going to have to agree on what specific conditions a separate process for accommodation therapy will be required. And, you know, we've seen other interventions uh, through the CATA reimbursement review process having specialized processes. So we have complex reviews and tailored reviews and the like. Uh, is there a need to have a specialized process on the HTA side uh, or even at the PCPA side for combination therapies? Um, and is there a need for a specialized negotiation approach? So uh, is it going to be a PLA-based approach, which is the tool that is used most frequently now? Um, or uh, are there other approaches that we could use, like this safe harbor approach uh, that some jurisdictions internationally are considering and exploring? Um, which one is going to be most feasible in the Canadian context? Um, or maybe it's a combination of both. So we need to be able to explore that, but to do that, uh, we need to have a place to be able to do that. The final recommendation uh, was to just look at other practical areas that require adaptation. So, um, so uh, to this point, uh, product listing protocols and agreements uh, and draft clauses could be explored. So, you know, PLA, you know, payers are using uh, certain templates for product listing agreements that talk about market disruptions and the like. Um, and so, or at least that's what we heard. Um, and however, could they build in more into these agreements that, so that they can anticipate the introduction of combination therapies? Uh, and then that would actually um, create, uh, that would create some kind of, uh, there would be some sort of uh, more automatic uh, shift to, uh, to a, an uh, alternate price arrangement or some sort of blended price arrangement that incorporates the combination therapy recommendations, for example. And should CADETH revisit its existing value-based pricing premium? Right now, they're, as I said, they're creating price reductions based entirely on the drug B, the new product that is combined with drug A, uh, using list prices. Um, however, uh, essentially all of the all the value falls on drug B and all of the uh, price reduction falls on, on drug B. Uh, could they, is there a way that they could consider maybe maintaining that approach and then using a different approach or, or even just using a different approach? We need to develop case studies though to show how this would work. And so we understand it further. Uh, and so we could develop a case example of indication specific tracking. So develop a case example that explores these different frameworks, the, the evaluation framework, the price negotiation, implementation and revisitation, uh, and then see how, what's going on in the current uh, landscape, what would go on in a different world where we use one or more of these different approaches. Um, that's gonna be helpful for people to understand what the implications could be. Yeah, Don, just one point. Um, I do know there was some interesting feedback from, from payers and others who've been involved in various negotiations in which uh, uh, the point three there where value attribution, like indication specific pricing and value attribution for the kind of the product depending on its use had different differential values provided to it. And there were people who said some of the approaches have already been done on some classes of, of particular drugs that uh, were embedded within, I think, confidential agreements. <laughs> but there are kind of methods, I think. Um, we're not totally starting from scratch on approaches methodologically that might 
make value attribution to a number of components combining combining to a price which fits under uh, uh, an affordability threshold for the payer uh, uh, that that the techniques exist. So that was, uh, um, and I forget the particular kind of products, but it was it was the existing a uh, value attribution indication based pricing had had uh, occurred. Also that there were ways to uh, control more at the um, uh, pharmacy and distribution stage, I think, on some kind of thing. So, the, so there's a, a really some useful innovative ideas that were mapped forward. So, now, something I didn't include in this slide deck, um, but I could have, and it's in the report, is we then took all of these actions uh, and we said, okay, uh, who uh, might be responsible for doing uh, some of these things or what combination of people? So, we do have specific recommendations for. What, what could Cadeth be doing here? What could manufacturers be doing? What could payers be doing to motivate and make more progress in, in, in uh, recognizing uh, and dealing with this issue? So uh, those are in the report um, and um, simply uh, sort of take are more specific, but we thought a starting point would be um, recommendations that are constructive that, uh, that, that could be moved forward. So uh, I will stop there. Uh, you can actually find the report uh, if you uh, take a photo of this QR code um, and have a look at those um, specific recommendations. Uh, there was a question here, is there a recording of this presentation discussion that's going to be available for those that could not attend? John? Um, I will uh, check and we may be able to uh... Uh, it's on a Zoom thing. I'll check and see whether it likely is possible we'd be able to post the, the webinar either on our YouTube channel or, or actually a link onto where the report is posted, if that would be helpful. And uh, we will send, uh, I think the we can send the slides around to all those who, who participated today. Okay. Uh, so again, if anybody has any more specific questions or comments, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom uh, to ask questions. Maybe we've dealt with all the questions. And I think we dealt as we went. Um, so that is... <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Oliver. <laughs> but... Uh, um... Yeah, hopefully this was the beginning of a conversation. We have some thoughts about some ongoing uh, work, but certainly really uh, fantastic contribution from our industry partners and public payer partners in a robust discussion. So we thought it was, uh, uh, this is a first step of us. We posted it and then we wanted to actually share it in this kind of format to continue the uh, momentum, um, which was... Uh, in the day when we were um, always continually doing things virtually, but we do hope to perhaps even present in uh, abstract and poster form, perhaps at some upcoming conferences and things like that to, to make things uh, uh, move forward to keep the discussion and channels going. But happy to follow up with anybody and thanks very much, Don, and thanks for uh, everyone for participating. Thanks, everyone. And uh, please don't hesitate. If afterwards you have some questions, you can email either John or myself. Um, and uh, we would be happy to answer any questions. Okay. So thank you. Mm -hmm.